This section of the document will take place with some rather hurried shots of the objects in question, which is to say the cinematography will be less studied and careful, and probably none of the museum's tags for the objects will be legible. This is because many of the shots following in this section were taken on the fly, as this documentarian was under suspicion upon this particular visit to the British Museum. Basically, the first three times this documentarian went to the British Museum, much filming was done and no one noticed, but then this documentarian released his first documentary, British Bits Undercover at the British Museum, and while that documentary was admittedly rudimentary, it still caused a few shockwaves here and there among the British Museum slash Freemason slash Illuminati community. And from that point on, in the final three visits this documentarian made to the British Museum, one of which this documentarian retrieved his aforementioned old college friend Kelly in, this documentarian found himself being watched more frequently by museum staff and even followed and that definitely notes were taken on his presence. Have you ever wondered about the story of Leonardo da Vinci writing his notes in his notebook upside down and backwards? Do you know how that story goes? It goes that Leonardo da Vinci wrote his notes upside down and backwards to keep people from reading over his shoulder his bright ideas. And you hear that story and you think, oh, okay, I see. But then you realize with the slightest thought that story crumbles. Because how would Leonardo da Vinci not notice someone reading over his shoulder? And how could the streets of old Italy be that crowded all the time? Remember, there simply sim remember there simply weren't as many people back then as there are now. Also, there was no morning train in those days to ride to the office. So, when would the opportunity even arise for someone to be stood close beside and looking over? Leonardo da Vinci's shoulder. Ancient Italy was simply not that chock full of people, and therefore the story must be utter bollocks, as the British would say. Notes are things that people take quite openly, actually. When someone gets out a pen and a bit of paper and writes something down, that is an obvious action. But no one will gather around to read the note. That's just rude. Therefore, Leonardo da Vinci, and for that matter, anyone anywhere in the entire timeline of history, has nothing to worry about uh, when he took his notes as far as someone peeping over his shoulder and British Museum staff in the employ of the Illuminati and the Freemasons conversely could take notes on this documentarian, that is, myself. Hereafter, uh, I will be known in the interests of academia as this documentarian. Uh, um, so any And so anyhow, this documentarian could see them taking notes on himself, but he wasn't about to stand next to them and read over their shoulders their notes on himself. But as far as that goes, this documentarian wound up fearing for his life during his final three visits to the British Museum, and therefore this section of the document will contain a fair few shots done quickly, done on the fly. So. That said, a stir-fry pan full of knuckles. We say that jokingly, of course, though it's hardly a joke. Indeed, this particular hoax of a supposed historical artifact is less a joke and more a signal of the tasteless, grotesque nature of contributors to the British Museum. Somewhere around 1000 A.D., the savage Morlay of Bath Hill 
became what would be known a thousand years later as a serial killer. If serial killers could find work as tenant farmers, indeed, there in 1000 AD, Morlay was known for his unfettered tenant farming, and he went and worked several farms, working each until he became tired with his constant weariness over the farming, and slaughtered the lords of the lands, and collected their knuckles in a pan he'd received from a visitor from the far east. Now, can you imagine if a modern-day serial killer collected a bunch of knuckles of corporate fat cats in a jar and donated that to the British Museum, and the outcry that would cause if the British Museum put those knuckles on display? This documentarian would therefore suggest this very exhibit is a high example of the perversion of the notion of historical context that flows like a common cold throughout the British Museum. Here then now we have one of these Florentine statues depicting a biblical wrestling match. Of course, this being one of the statues robbed of Florence during the First World War in another startling example, of turn-of-the-century British souvenir collectors stealing with one hand while referring to the Italians as a dirty bunch of unwashed thieves with the other hand. The statue remains unnamed, and the British Museum, <clears throat> in its arrogance, has seen ill fit to actually place a tag there, too. So, even if this documentarian had not been in a hurry with paranoia, there would have been no shoddy tag to film. In any case, multiple Vatican documents recently released from under the oppression of the Thatcherites have revealed this statue to depict the murder of Cain by Abel. Facial hair being considered a sin in ancient times as well as Florentine times, Abel is, of course, sculpted, wearing a beard, in league with the devil, as he is. Cain is naked, a sign of vulnerability and victimhood, but also a sign of purity and angelicness. In biblical times, a man could walk around naked and instantly be recognized as a saint. The prominence and centrality of the nipple suggests death, but also the promise of rebirth and feeding at a new breast with a new life in the offing. You'll find none of this valuable information anywhere in the British Museum's tag for the statue, however, and you'll be lucky to even find the tag.